Introduction by Andreas Nader in the lectures of November 1917, gathered here in abridged form, a topic emerges that Rudolf Steiner only spoke about in these particular lectures, or more precisely, in the lecture held in St. Galen on 16th November and in the lectures held in Dornock on the 18th, 19th, and 25th of November 1917. Neither before nor after did he speak about the secret of what he calls are called the geographical doppelganger or the aramonic doppelganger. The reason why we have entitled this volume The Electronic Doppelganger will be explained in more detail below. First, however, Steiner discusses several other topics, both in the St. Galen Lecture and in the Dornock Lectures, which all relate to the topic of the doppelganger as we shall see. He first speaks... of the existence of Western occult brotherhoods that have an interest in propagating materialism to such an extent that even greater numbers of the deceased are thereby unable to extricate themselves from earthly existence, for souls that remain entangled within the material realm after death produce destructive effects, with these, which these brotherhoods are able to make use of for their own purposes. Connected with this is the first main theme of these lectures, namely the interests of certain Western occult groups who are seeking to control the earth by material and technological means, and whose activities extend into the realm of the dead. According to Steiner, this exercise of power is only possible because certain secrets are kept secret and deliberately withheld. These secrets relate to the supersensible nature of the human being and concern the Aramonic or geographical doppelganger. By speaking about these previously undisclosed occult facts for the first and only time here in these lectures, Rudolf Steiner deliberately counters this principle of maintaining secrecy in order to exercise power. For that reason, these lectures are of a huge significance in terms of the secrets revealed within them, as will be explained in what follows. Before doing so, however, we need to consider the historical background to the matters set out here. This concerns what Steiner refers to as the fall of the spirits of darkness. He had previously spoken about that topic in the lectures held from the middle to the end of October 1917 in Dornoch, and again shortly afterwards in Zurich on the 6th and 13th of November. The relevant passages have been included in our compilation. The fall of the spirits of darkness relates to these matters as follows. Steiner describes a historical but supersensible event that took place between 1841 and 1879 as a kind of reflection of the fight with the dragon described in the apocalypse. In order to prepare for his rulership as the time spirit from 1879 onwards, the archangel Michael who is also referred to in the Apocalypse, had to cast out spirits of darkness onto the earth, i.e. into the consciousness of the human being. The human beings. This battle in the etheric world ended after 38 years. In 1879, Michael had triumphed over the spirits of darkness, who, since that time, can only operate in the physical world, i.e. within the earthly consciousness of human beings. And 38 years after 1879, the earthly consequences of this fall were manifested in 1917. This explains why Steiner spoke about the matters discussed here in the year 1917 in particular. He also characterized materialism, which had been spreading since the 1840s as the ultimate expression of this fall. We now have to consider what types of spirits Rudolf Steiner means when he speaks about the spirits of darkness, whom he characterizes as belonging to the realm of the angeloi. In particular, we need to consider the kind of consciousness angeloi possess. As angels do not have physical bodies, but etheric bodies as the lowest constituents of their being, they live in their thinking directly in the etheric sphere, thus without needing to reflect their thoughts in a physical body. In the etheric world, the time here becomes space. The time here becomes space dictum applies. Everything that in the physical world must be thought in temporal succession appears simultaneously 
in the etheric, in their thinking. Angels, therefore, live permanently in this space or anti-space of the etheric thoughts do not rise in succession for them, but are simultaneous and permanently observable as a kind of panorama. Furthermore, angels do not need their etheric bodies to maintain a physical body and can therefore fully dedicate all their energies to the activity of thinking. As a consequence, angels possess foresight and a clairvoyant overview, which is also what enables the personal guardian angel who accompanies a human being to guide that person's destiny. At the beginning of the modern period, a whole group of angels had turned to Araman, thereby darkening and obscuring the etheric sphere. This is what Michael, the ruler of this etheric thought sphere, had to redress by casting out these beings into the earthly realm. Angels that become spirits of darkness and are cast out of the etheric into the earthly realm, the realm of human consciousness, lose their previous clairvoyance in the process. They are cast out of the etheric web of light and panoramic vista of simultaneity simultaneity into our earthly consciousness where succession in time is, disturb, is determined by physical materiality. This kind of darkening or obfuscation is one of the es essential characteristics of the being whom Rudolf Steiner calls Armin. Armin wishes to bind the consciousness of human beings, their free powers of attention to the earthly realm. With the help of the spirits of darkness, he seeks to obscure the etheric from human beings. This is a goal that Araman has only been able to achieve since the time when thinking effectively took up its seat within the physical body. Before the dawn of the modern period, human beings did not think with their physical brains, but with their etheric bodies. That meant their thoughts were not as closely tied to the nerve sense system as they are today. Since the onset of the modern period, however, thoughts are reflected in the physical body, thus bound to the nerve sense system. Living ideas are paralyzed as we experience them, and this is what enables us to research and understand material processes with such precision. Living thinking woven within the etheric is limited, in a sense, by the physical body and deadened. Let me say that again. Living thinking that is woven within the etheric is limited, in a sense, by the physical body and deadened. The further evolution of human consciousness should now consist of us overcoming the darkening link to materialistic consciousness by our awakening to the etheric quality of thinking. However, that is precisely what the spirits of darkness, those angeloi beings, are seeking to prevent. Since due to their aramonic coloring, they had to leave the etheric realm and can now only operate within the earthly realm of our materialistic consciousness. Knowledge of this historic occult event was another secret whose those Western Brotherhoods wished to keep to themselves so as to be able to exert power. Rudolf Steiner also spoke about this again entirely deliberately in 1917 in order to make knowledge of these matters accessible to humanity. For if the powers of the spirits of darkness were used in such a way that nobody else could have any knowledge of them, then that would naturally be the best way of fixating human consciousness on the purely material, even after death. It is only against this background that the real focus of the lectures gathered here, the secret of the geographical doppelganger, can be understood correctly. In these lectures, in the autumn of 1917, Rudolf Steiner calls attention to a particular feature of our nervous system. He explains here for the first and only time that there is a being within our nervous system that does not belong to what constitutes the human being at all. An aramonic being that enters the human being shortly before birth and is forced to leave again on the latter's death. This aramonic being provides a basis for all electrical currents we need in our nervous system in order to process our sense perceptions, coordinate them, and react to them. The human being thus arrives into this world with his organism in which he clothes himself 
without reaching down into this organism with his soul. There is, however, an opportunity. Shortly before we are born, not long at all before we are born, for another spiritual being, in addition to our soul, to take ownership of our physical body. Of the subconscious part of our body, it is just a fact that shortly before we are born, we are permeated by another being whom, in our current terminology, we would call an harmonic spiritual being. This being is as much within us as our own soul is within us. Such beings live their lives by using the human being in order to be present within the sphere in which they wish to be. They have an extraordinarily high level of intelligence and a very highly developed will, but nothing in the nature of a life of feeling. Germut, not what we would call a human life of feeling. And so it is indeed the case that we go through our lives with a soul and this doppelganger who is cleverer, far cleverer than we are. This being is highly intelligent, but possesses a Mephistophelian intelligence, an Aramonic intelligence, as well as a very strong will, a will that is much closer to the forces of nature than our human will, which is tempered by our life of feeling. In the 19th century, natural science discovered that the nervous system is permeated by electrical forces. And natural science was right about that. However, if science holds, or scientists believe, that our nerve forces, which belong to us and provide a basis for our life of thought, have anything to do with the electrical currents passing through our nerves, then they are mistaken. For the electrical currents are the forces that are placed into our being by that other being whom I have just described, and do not belong to our being at all. We do also carry electrical currents within us, but they are of a purely harmonic nature. Medical science tells us that electrical currents, so-called action potentials, are built up and transmitted both in our brain and within the rest of our nervous system. These are measurable with an ECG or EEG. If a current flows, and this is a message that is transmitted, which triggers the relevant chemical reactions. If no current flows, then this is also a message and no chemical reaction takes place. Our entire nervous system is pervaded by such currents, which convey stimuli to the brain that are received via sense organs from the outer world. They also coordinate via the nerve pathways and nerve cells the movements of our muscular apparatus in response to sensory, stim sensory stimuli. For example, if the surface of our hand conveys a strong stimulus from a hot plate, our arm instantly reacts. Our arm reacts instantly and our hand is immediately retracted. These reactions require neither a thought process nor an emotional response. The soul remains completely excluded in this case while the body reacts with spontaneous reflex. The harmonic being who lives with us in our body is therefore necessary for our earthly consciousness. We would not be able to live without this being, which is also apparent from the fact that our life ends the moment no electrical current flows through our nervous system. At the same time, however, Rudolf Steiner also identifies this harmonic doppelganger as the originator of illness, specifically illness, illnesses that depend upon geographical conditions. Why is that? It is because the harmonic doppelganger is himself subject to geographical conditions, since the Earth is also permeated by electromagnetic forces. These forces are aligned according to the Earth's mountain ranges and are particularly strong where mountain chains run from south to north rather than from east to west. Rudolf Steiner points out that these forces active within the human nervous system correspond to such electrical and magnetic forces. He then indicates that humanity in the 20th century will be in a position to transfer these forces to machines. I have frequently pointed out, quite deliberately, including in public lectures, that human consciousness is associated with forces of destruction. Into our nervous system, we die. These forces, these death forces, will become even more powerful, and the connection will be made between the death forces in the human being, which are related to electromagnetic forces and outer machine forces. In a sense, the human being will be able to let his thoughts flow into the machine forces. 
as yet undiscovered forces within the human being will be discovered, forces that have an effect on outer electrical and magnetic forces. Now, one of the pioneers of computer technology in America, John von Neumann, described his method of developing the computer in the 1950s as follows. To design the machine, my coworkers and I tried to imitate some of the known operations of the live brain. This aspect led me to study neurology and eventually to give lectures on the possibilities of copying an extremely simplified model of the living brain from man-made machines. As the only one among his colleagues, von Neumann studied neurology alongside his work on developing the first computers. That is why no one apart from him noticed that they were actually what they were actually doing in developing these machines. Transmission of all information in the computer, just as in the nervous system, is based on the polarity of current slash no current. In the case of the human organism, however, a significant amount of chemistry also plays a role in terms of what are known as messenger substances or neurotransmitters. When we consider computer technology, it is apparent from the above that we are dealing with an externalized aramonic doppelganger, whom in the context of the lectures by Steiner gathered here, I would like to call the electronic doppelganger. It is no accident that for a long time now, the computer has been called the PC, the personal computer. Almost all the work we do with our minds is now done only with the help of computers and their networking via the internet. Nearly all areas of our life, our personal data, our work, our consumer purchases are captured and recorded by computers. The personal computer does indeed now accompany us as a kind of electronic doppelganger. And the nature of the personal computer is exactly as Rudolf Steiner described the harmonic doppelganger. And so it is indeed the case that we go through our lives with a soul in this doppelganger who is cleverer, far cleverer than we are. This being is highly intelligent, but possesses a Mephistophelian intelligence, an harmonic intelligence, as well as a very strong will. A will that is much closer to the forces of nature than our human will, which is tempered by the life of feeling. The computer is a cold machine with a very high level of intelligence and an uncompromising will, otherwise known as efficiency. Numerous processes of movement, including the conduct of warfare, are today guided by computers. Even our economic life, with all its money flows, is today largely controlled by these machines. It is therefore evident that Rudolf Steiner had such an extensive overview of the technological developments of the 20th century that he was able to foresee the transition from the industrial age to the digital age. At this point, we should discuss the term doppelganger. Steiner used this term in all his basic works, in his lectures and in his mystery dramas, to designate a being who accompanies us like a shadow even after death and through our different lives on earth. At a certain point in the lecture of 16 November 1917, reprinted in this book, he distinguishes the Aramonic doppelganger discussed here from the Luciferic doppelganger, who he, whom he otherwise simply refers to as the doppelganger or the double. In the sense of the human being's shadow, the distinction is essential insofar as the aramonic doppelganger only accompanies us from birth to death during one life on earth. In this lecture, however, Steiner goes one step further by connecting the discovery of the aramonic doppelganger with the previously described fall of the spirits of darkness. He describes the attempt by Western occult lodges to keep these facts secret in order to exploit them as a deliberate means of exerting power and of darkening people's awareness of supersensible reality. In order to understand this connection, we have to look more closely at the physiological basis of human soul life. We have a nervous system that supports our sense-bound consciousness. The latter is not identical to our soul experience. In order to become aware of a sense impression, we require a sense organ and the relevant nerve pathways in the brain and nervous system. The nerve impulses generated can be physically measured and observed, but not so our soul experience. The color red and the song of a blackbird will never be found physically in the brain or in the neural pathways. Where then does this soul experience occur? 
if it cannot be found within the body? The answer to that question is that our soul experience does not pl take place in the body, but where the sensory phenomena is located, i.e. outside of the body. After all, I do not hear the blackbird singing in my head, but on the branch of a tree. I do not see the color red in my eye, but externally on the wall. In our soul life, we are able, we are always with the things that we are perceiving at the moment. Let me read that again. In our soul life, we are always with the things that we are perceiving at the moment. The nerve sense organization merely serves as a kind of mirror in which we are able to become conscious of our soul experience. As Steiner had described in an earlier date, but how does the soul experience outside the body relate to the nerve sense organization? Rudolf Steiner spent almost his whole life researching the gap that opens up here between the realm of the soul and the physical body bodily realm. He sought to understand the link between the soul and the body right down to the physiological details. In doing so, he discovered the essential function of the etheric body. To begin with, the function of our etheric body is to animate, construct, and organize our physical body. It is the designer who shapes our, the organs and regulates their interactions. However, the, however, these forces of form and organization are not only used to animate and organize physical materials, but can also be used to grasp, shape, and retain experiences gained through our soul spiritual facilities, i.e. through our eye and our astral body in the form of thoughts and perceptions. Our memory enables us to bring our soul experiences to life repeatedly. Steiner pointed out on many occasions as one of his central discoveries that the nature of our etheric body undergoes a change around our seventh year of life. After the formation and construction of the physical body has been concluded, a part of the life functions of the etheric body is freed up during the second seven-year period and can henceforth serve the creation of thoughts and memories. Our powers of thought and memory, we could also say our powers of attention, are therefore transformed life forces. They could also be called free forces, as they have been freed from the task of providing for the life of our physical body. At the beginning of the human earthly life, most noticeably during the embryo period, these forces within our etheric body act as forces of creation and growth. During the course of earthly life, a part of these forces emancipate themselves from the formation and growth activities and become the powers of thought that bring about the shadowy thought world for normal consciousness. It is of utmost importance to know that the normal powers of thought of the human being are in fact refined forces of formation and growth. How precisely does this transformation take place, which becomes outwardly apparent from around the age of seven onwards? In the inner part of the brain, there are ventricles, which are a network of blood vessels, choroid plexus, here, arterial blood, which supplies and maintains life, is converted into cerebrospinal fluid. Our brain and central, central nervous system are kept almost afloat within this fluid, while the fluid itself is constantly moved by the rhythm of our breathing. It rises and sinks with the spirit spinal canal, depending on whether we are breathing in or breathing out. In this physiological phenomena, we have an accurate reflection of the transformation of the formative life forces, which find their expression within the arterial blood into the powers that shape our experiences. These are the free forces which, freed from the metabolic processes, are manifested as the crystal clear cerebrospinal fluid. Our astral body lives within our breathing. Through our breathing in and breathing out, our astral body is able to influence the cerebrospinal fluid because the rhythm of our breathing is transferred via our diaphragm to the fluid flowing within the spinal cord. We have a chart here. I'll... Uh, We'll call this chart one. I'll try to show them. 
I'll describe this chart to you. Figure one, schematic illustration of the brain with the flows of cerebrospinal fluid indicated by the black arrows. The checked area, choroid plexus, shown with the arrows pointing upwards in the inner part represents the network of blood vessels in which the inner cerebrospinal fluid is formed. This flows out via the two ventricles shown bottom left and right. The inner gray surfaces should be imagined as permeated through and through by the plexus of nerves, which is then linked via the nerve tracts to the sense organs. Source A. Husman der Hornod Miss it says something in German. I can't read it. More German uh, translated and public, published by Real Center. The astral body is thereby able to draw on the formative forces of the etheric body that are no longer required for the metabolic processes for its own purposes. From a physiological point of view, this forms the basis of our mental images and our feeling life. Our ability to form images of the outer world derives from the fact that the rhythm of our breathing touches upon our nerve currents. Thoughts, abstract thoughts, are still entirely bound to the nervous system, but the visual element is linked to our living breathing. Therefore, you could say here, we have life as a formative force. The astral body of the consciously experiencing human being requires for the formation of consciousness, i.e. the formation of mental images, a bodily basis that is able to emulate or reflect these experiences. While our nervous system forms the basis for our dead, abstract thoughts and imageless concepts lacking in feeling, our living thinking and experiencing are related to the cerebral spinal fluid that is brought into oscillation through our breathing. The soul experience of the astral body finds a connection to the material physical processes in the nervous system via the rhythmic breathing in the cerebrospinal fluid, which is the former arterial blood now freed from the metabolic processes. The same sculpting formative forces of the etheric body, which previously built up the physical body by transferring nutrients within the arterial blood and supplying them to the vital organs, are free to be used from about the seventh year onward, as we already mentioned, in the formation of conscious and deliberate mental images. If human beings only had an astral body and an eye, but no etheric body, then although they would be able to have experiences and sense impressions, these would be fleeting and it would not be possible to retain them. The etheric body is also what retains our experiences until their dissolution, which is when they are let go by the astral body, i.e. when they are forgotten. Through the venous blood, the etheric body is able to hold on to experiences in such a way that they are imprinted like the characters of a script onto the various organs and in connection with them into the brain. These processes are therefore also what underlies the formation of memory. As the formative forces are not transformed back into forces that form and nourish the body, but remain in a sense available as free forces, they are able to imprint material representations of the content of mental images into the body. In this process, the relevant parts of the brain form the material basis. When the astral body relinquishes the formative forces, i.e., if a mental image or soul experience fades from our consciousness, then in its place a purely etheric form is created that is no longer held in our consciousness. Physiologically, this corresponds to the reabsorption of the cerebrospinal fluid into the venous blood. In this manner, the etheric body changes from being the preserver of the physical body into the preserver of the contents of consciousness. In the remembering processes, these stored memory contents are then read by the astral body within the etheric body as past experiences. The soul reads the signs imprinted into the physical body in the same way that we hear music via the physically resounding notes, even though the essence of the music lies in the spirit realm between the notes. It reads them in the same way that we read letters on a page, even though the contents of what is written does not live on the page. In this way, the soul recalls past experiences that are represented in the bodily engrams. However, the inscribing of engrams does not happen immediately, as it normally takes three days and nights until that has been experienced. 
has actually been processed by the etheric and physical bodies. This processing mainly takes place during the night. Our dreams are a manifestation of this nightly remembering, since they arise on our awakening through the astral body and the eye coming into contact with the etheric and physical bodies. While we consciously attend to our experiences and sense impressions, our etheric body continuously works on incorporating and imprinting them into our physical body. <clears throat> We have now outlined a subject area that we need to be familiar with in order to understand the technology related to the Aramonic doppelganger. The powers of remembering and creating mental imagery actually reside in the etheric body. However, not only are they bound to the nervous system, such as in the case for dead abstract thinking and mental picturing, but also, as Rudolf Steiner said in the passage quoted above, these forces these death forces will become even more powerful and the connection will be made between the death forces in the human being which are related to electromagnetic forces and outer machine forces in a sense the human being will be able to let his thoughts flow into these machine forces but this means nothing other than that the technology foreseen by Steiner will no longer be industrial technology, but consciousness technology, or more precisely, attentiveness technology. This technology breaks the connection between the nerve sense system and our soul spirit, precisely at the point where the two are connected via the free forces of the etheric body and replaces the free forces with the electro electronic doppelganger. Our soul experience, including the creation of memory, is thereby bound to the machine. Or to put it another way, a large proportion of humanity's powers of attention are now bound to machines with the help of the consciousness technologies of the Internet and computers. Many of our memory functions are also being replaced by the computer and the Internet, the later in the sense of a universal, albeit virtual, technical medium. Are you with me so far? This is earth shattering information. This is the most important information that you as a human being can imbibe right now. I'm getting tired of reading this and so we'll have to call it quits on this episode. But I will be back and I will read more of this to you. Thank you.